You're listening to Don't Waste Water. The infrastructure funds, uh, we're grateful for them, but they're simply a down payment. They're not going to solve the underlying problem, right? Utilities have to get very deliberate and judicious about where they are going to put their resources because inevitably they're probably going to have to increase rates or figure out where to cut other expenses in order to eventually replace all of the lead lines in their system. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Twist Water podcast. In October, here in the United States, every single water system, so 150,000 of them, are going to have to submit digital copies of their lead service line inventories. And And most regulator states don't have a tool to consume that amount of data. And if they did have a tool, they don't have it in a way to, hey, tell me what the data is telling me and how is that way to improve my workflow as a regulator? Because again, they're going to get all of these inventories coming in all at once. And so that's a massive data problem for them. I'm your host, Antoine Valter. And in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome back Megan Glover as my guest. We've, we're a little bit ahead of the market, if I'm being honest, with the features and functions that were in our technology technology probably two years ago. And right now, now that the market is seeing their data come to life and how our platform is able to manage those programs, light bulbs are going off and saying, well, I could also be using you for this. Megan is the CEO and founder of 120 Water. At a certain point in time, there's going to be a consolidation and building a vertical. Will you be the one which eats all the other ones or are you a brick? in the world. I think we'll let Johnny continue to build out that vertical. How about that? Interesting. <laughs> 120 Water protects public health by combining cloud-based software and digital sampling kits to help execute water safety, compliance, and wastewater monitoring programs. Megan was my guest a bit over three years ago, and since that episode aired at the beginning of season three of this podcast, I'm pretty proud to say that the number of water investors, entrepreneurs, and enthusiasts like you currently listening to this that joined me on this podcast journey week after week got multiplied by a little over 10. In May 2021, 1,223 people tuned in, while in May 2024, 12,350 folks showed up. Tenix is incredible. Thank you all for that. Yet, that's no match with 120 Water's growth over that same period of time. As Megan's brainchild grew to 10,000 customers, hence making a 50x compared to her first appearance on my microphone. You know how we often discussed the growth and adoption timelines in WaterTech on this mic, not just to check on milestones, but because it actually matters when you're projecting your impact and returns on investment as a growth stage player. Now, if we were to draw the ideal water founder profile, it would probably quite closely match Megan's portrait, as you'll hear again in a minute, if you were not around when I interviewed Tom Ferguson. So, checking on her milestones serves as a good indicator of what's achievable in that coveted water tech space. As for Oxide's update three weeks ago with Fajr Mushtaq, you'll see today that first it takes time, but also that second, if you've got your founder slash product market fit right, it will gain traction. Nothing's easy in our sector. We know that, right? But success becomes almost inevitable if you understand the market right, find just a proper balance between protecting your cash and investing in your growth, build your way to profitability and, as 120 Water just did with a $43 million raise, then leverage your beachhead to aim for scale. There was a lot to learn from Megan Glover in 2021. I would postulate there are even more insights to gain from her 2024 version and probably also a little bit of fun to have while listening to that conversation that will start right after I remind you that the only way I got this 10x in audience is through people like you, telling their friends, their colleagues, their bosses, or their teams to listen to that very cool podcast episode and to subscribe for more. So please, now it's your turn. Do it and I'll meet you on the other side. Hi, Megan. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to have you for a full set of reasons. But one of these reasons is that since we recorded, I had lots of people giving and using your example to say, if you have to pick one way of doing entrepreneurship right in the water sector, look at what Megan did. So I thought I could synthesize everything they said, or I could just make you listen to that one. Megan Glover at 120 was probably at the vanguard of this. We were starting to see people build revenues faster than anybody had ever seen it before. And this was one of the first times I'd seen an outsider 
do this. Marketing background, decided she wanted to do something about water. And then I think it was about 350 people she spoke to. She was so bored by the end of it. And she was exactly right. Because when you get bored, that's where, you're, again, you're seeing diminishing marginal surprises. So you can get to a very thin gap between reality and your understanding of reality. When we first spoke in 2021, you mentioned the 350 interviews. And that got like V1 of 120 water. I would believe, though, that by V2, 3, I don't know how you would define it, 120 water is a bit different. So would you call it a pivot? And what's the story? Oh, goodness. By the way, I love Tom. Tom Ferguson, big fan, always a big fan, and he's too kind. So we removed the audit. That was a decision that we made after our Series A investment to remove the audit because in our countless interviews with customers in the market, they said, that's really scary. The term audit, no one wants to be audited. That was one of the byproducts of, we knew we wanted to expand the 120 Water platform through various software applications, through our different product lines, such as water testing kits kits, pitcher filter remediation kits, communications, and we strategically removed the audit, one, because the market told us it was scary, and we agreed, and then to extend and kind of broaden the platform and the products that we could put under that 120 water brand. So you wanted to expand the product and have more things within the brand? It yeah. sounds to me like you laser focused on a specific section of the markets. Is that right? You know, I wish I could say that, but we actually broadened it. So 120 water now versus 2021, we actually now have three separate software applications that we sell into the drinking water sector. And we kind of size that sector from the top down, the top being the actual regulators that have to conform to these new regulations and execute compliance across their state or jurisdiction. We have a software application that helps then the utilities, the boots on the ground, as we like to say, execute those compliance events and programs. And then we also have a facilities application that's used primarily for drinking water and water quality testing across multiple facilities and buildings across all 50 states in the U.S. Let me be nerdy and techy upfront. That means three different pieces of software which are fully independent, or is it a platform where you can activate or deactivate one or the other? Yeah, so we benefit from everything the cloud has to offer and that everything is hosted on Amazon Web Services and we have shared backends and microservices. So what I mean by that is, let's say we have a communications module across all of our different platforms. So the code and microservices are leveraged across all of the platforms, but the front end is vastly different depending on the customer segment and how they need to interface with the software application. So for the most part, same backend and our architecture and infrastructure, but the front end is vastly different. So if you have to define 120 Water, is it a software company? We are on a journey to become more of a software company for sure. We've traditionally been what I would call technology-enabled services, where about a quarter of the business was software and the rest was products and services. But over the last 24 months, we've actually seen our product mix even out. And that's been really interesting in terms of how we staff and the processes we put in place because operating a software company is very different than a technology-enabled services company. It's also probably much more of an uptake, potentially. I mean, a software company, sky's the limit. A water company, if you're not gradient Sky is more of a glass ceiling. Yeah, and that's what we love. The three separate kind of software applications that we have is that we can make demonstrable progress in a matter of two releases. We can bring wholly new programs that our customers can use to manage other things in water in you know six weeks versus hardware or other services that may take a lot longer to put into the market and, and create. So we're having a lot of fun. So it's interesting because... From my perspective, when reviewing your news, your blog entries, your website, your posting on LinkedIn, my impression was that you had narrowed down and focused on that, which sounds to me like the one thing, not that you cannot do other stuff, but that's really the one thing where you have that super high market reaction and traction. Is that remotely true or is it really like 
you're offering the full bandwidth and others might not take the same sunlight, but they are equally important. So now we're getting into a little bit of the secret sauce here. The adoption for our software, the tailwinds are primarily regulatory driven and that regulation is led particularly here in the US. The interesting part about that regulation is, yes, the contaminant is lead, but it's a data management issue at the root cause of what we're doing. We are combining data sets from either legacy databases or tap cards or file cabinets and digitizing it in a way that our customers have never seen their data combined. And then when you layer on the program management aspect of what we do, whether that's around sample site locations or communications, whether that be email, letter, or microsite enablement, it's pretty magical to watch their data come to life. And then they have those light bulbs to say, oh, well, if I'm using you to do my lead program, why wouldn't I be doing all of my water quality parameters with you through your sample management? Or if I'm sending your customer notifications for a lead exceedance, why aren't I using your automated letter and email sending for all of my other communications? We've, we're a little bit of ahead of the market, if, if I'm being honest, with the, the features and functions that were in our technology probably two years ago. And right now, now that the market is seeing their data come to life and how our platform is able to manage those programs, light bulbs are going off and saying, well, I could also be using you for this. Lead is keeping us very busy because we do it better than anybody else but the full scope and capabilities of the platform goes far beyond just lead program management. What makes you do all of that better than anybody else? Be the lead or what you said about transforming a utility into a cool kit because now they can very, very smoothly communicate with their users. I did not think this was an advantage at the time when I started the company, but because I felt like an outsider and I really, really, truly felt like an outsider. But I can say now, almost 10 years in, it is precisely that outside experience that is allowing to bring these capabilities to the water sector because I lived them in previous lives through various software as a service companies. If you look at our platform and the different modules that we've created, some of my past experience in other technologies has DNA, right? Whether that be through the communications module, which I did content management platforms and email marketing platforms and marketing automation platforms for five years to inventory management, which I did through point of sale and inventory control. So again, I think it's knowing tactically what's possible and bringing that to water has been a huge advantage for us as we built out our capabilities. Let's go back through your steps to where we left it roughly three years ago. So in 2021, now finally lockdown is over. You can go out in the real world, I was about to say. But yeah, let's take some numbers for people to get that straight. Between the last time we spoke and today, if I do my maths roughly right, you've multiplied your customer base by 20. Is that remotely true? Uh, that? Yeah, I think we were maybe 200 customers three years ago. And now we serve over 10,000 direct and licensed customers. Okay, I have the numbers. You're right, it's more. Because in 2021, you do a 5x to 250. So that means mm -hmm. when we spoke, you must have been somewhere on that road between 50 and 250. By 2022, you're at 550. By mm -hmm. 2023, you're at 5,500. And the one I didn't have is that there's still a 2x after that, which is 10,000 today. What is the driver of that growth? And you can give me only one answer. We launched a new software application that allowed us to acquire more licensed customers. When does that happen? This had been in our a strategic roadmap for quite some time, but as you know, Tom points out, I'm a big believer of market fit. If you don't get the timing around market fit right, you waste a lot of money and money is our most precious resource, right? Cash is king. A couple of years ago, we had identified the need at our state regulator customer base that they were likely to have a need to manage this vast amount of data coming in from their water systems as a result of the lead and copper rule. So let me dial it down just a little bit. In October here in the United States, every single water system, so 150,000 of them are going to have to submit digital copies of their lead service line inventories. And most regulator states don't have a tool to consume that amount of data. And if they did have a tool, they don't have it in a way to, hey, tell me what the data is telling me and how is that going to improve my workflow as a regulator? Because again, they're going to get all of these inventories coming in all at once. And so that's a massive data problem for them. So long story short, this has always been on our roadmap. We did some 
early what we call lean canvas studies with this customer segment and said, if we were to launch a product like this, would it be helpful to you? Validated it enough that uh, we felt comfortable spending the resources on it. And then we launched that product in late 2022. And since then, you know, we've acquired about 5,000 licensed customers through that product application. Let me check if I get that one right. The regulation comes in late 2020, right? And gives until October 2024, so October of this year, for everybody to be up to speed with their inventory of deadlines. And Mm -hmm. I understand you're right. You identify three problems. Some data is existing, but it's scattered and it's in a way which is difficult to acquire. Some data doesn't exist, so you need to do an inventory to capture that data. And on the government level, they might get all that data, but if they don't know how to manage it, well, it's data for nothing. So those are the three. And hence, you develop three solutions which answer those three problems. Absolutely. Which one comes first? Is it like chicken and egg and the three have to grow together? Or what's the first one you tackle? The data management. The legacy data, which now you want to integrate. Yes. And we've developed a a proprietary process called Athena, which essentially normalizes all of the data. We use some data science and some predictive modeling against our existing customer's data set, as well as what we're able to procure through third-party systems. And we're able to return that data cleaner than we get it. So it's really allowed us to scale all our offerings offering and ensure that we can not only scale our offering, but make sure our customers have as clean of a data set as possible going into October. Having a clean data set is nice, but what's the value they get out of that? Is it compliance that they just have to do it? Or is there any other underlying value? Yes, it's checking a box in that you are in compliance, that you're going to have a data set in time for October. But again, because of our proprietary process of FINA, we can also weed out certain data sets uh, to basically lessen the workload. I don't mean to like totally nerd out on the weeds of the regulation, but essentially unknowns and lead are bad in that you're going to have to do work against all LEDs or all unknowns within your system. So if we're able to use data science to at least take a common denominator and say, you don't have to worry about these because we've appended or validated certain pieces of your data sets, then that's less work that you have to do with your baseline inventory. It's twofold. Generally, we're able to cut out some of the work they have to do through our data appending, and then also make sure that they have something that's submittable in October to achieve compliance. And so once they've achieved compliance in October, in November, they give up their 120 water license, jobs done, they don't need you anymore. Oh, I wish. Unfortunately, that's just when the job starts. (laughs) Jokes aside, what I would imagine, and I think we discussed that last time as well, is that there's these studies of the EPA, which start in the 80s, of what would be needed just to keep the same level of service on drinking water lines in the US. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the backlog goes up. It started slightly below 100 billion and nowadays it's at 500 billion. Where I'm heading with that is that when you have limited means, you need to have the best bang for your buck. And probably the best way to do that is to be very determined about where you want to replace some lines. And that's where I would see from my very distant eye, the maximum value which I could grasp out of 120 water. What's Mm -hmm. your opinion on that? The infrastructure funds, uh, we're grateful for them, but they're simply a down payment. They're not going to solve the underlying problem, right? Utilities have to get very deliberate and judicious about where they are going to put their resources because inevitably they're probably going to have to increase rates or figure out where to cut other expenses in order to eventually replace all of the lead lines in their system. And that's where the program management piece of our software comes into value with our customers because we're able to help them pinpoint the areas, whether that's applying disadvantaged data overlay onto their inventory or other types of means to help them prioritize, go here first because this is the area of most need or potentially this is the low hanging fruit that you can rule out. That's exactly where like the program management and the value after October comes into play with 120 is we're going to help you essentially run those programs that are going to whittle down your exact needs of the problem. We heard Tom in the beginning. You met Tom in an accelerator with Imagine H2O. Then, for weird reasons, he didn't invest in you. I don't get that, but that's a different story. What you did is you joined a different accelerator, the Elemental Accelerator. I had 
Kim Baker on that microphone even longer ago than I had you. Like everybody praises you as the thing one should do in entrepreneurship. And you're saying, well, I can still do better. Let me join an accelerator. What does it bring you at that stage of 120 water when you join the accelerator? Oh, Kim, another one of my favorite people. That's a great question. We have always had such immense value going through these accelerators and incubators because it's almost like a, its own skunk works project of the business. It's this concentrated time for us to solve or try to solve a problem in industry with unprecedented people at the table and minds. So we've already always just considered that somewhat of R&D investment, right? If it works, great. And here's a safe space to have it work. And if not, then we can write it off in terms of research and development. But that's how we've always viewed these um, accelerators and incubators is let's really use this to kind of incubate that next thing at 120 water and, and hopefully it works out. Elemental is just, again, unprecedented access to folks in industry to really fully bake those concepts and ideas. Is it what took you to Hawaii or is it to different <laughs> And then it takes you to Hawaii, right? Which unfortunately I didn't get to go because I was too busy CEO waiting, I think at that time. But I know I would encourage anybody to take advantage of those, like particularly in water, because it takes a village and you never know who you're going to meet in those experiences that's going to help you along the way. I mentioned that half as a joke, but half as a fact as well, which is that you are rolling out in Hawaii water. Yes. Which got me curious because when I look at your websites, there are so many news of you're working with that state's rural water, that state's rural water. Mm -hmm. You're a growth stage company, and it seems like your crowd is that scattered, atomized landscape of super small utilities. What's your go-to market? How do you reach them? The U.S. water market is very fragmented. 85% of the U.S. water market is rural water. You know, reaching the large, what I call NFL communities, as well as the investor-owned, we knew how to reach those folks back in 2020, 21. But we as a business did want to go down market because we believe that our mission, everyone deserves the technology that Denver Water uses. We're really out on a mission and a journey to democratize the technology and access to technology all the way down to the smallest of systems. So we had to do some research and trial and error to figure out how do we do that at scale? And when should we even do it? So it was a bet we made, but it's a bet that's paid off because what we've really found and linked into is our strong partnerships at the state level with these rural water associations that really become these trusted advisors to these rural communities. And we not only affiliate partner with them in terms of they do a lot of our education, they take a lot of our content to educate their communities, but we also leverage them as boots in the field. They have circuit riders that go around and their sole job is to go around and help these water systems. And we leverage their services in the field as well to execute on our behalf. So it's really been what I believe is a one plus one equals three type relationship because not only are we helping them provide more value to their communities, but they're helping us kind of reach these communities as scale. So let me take the devil's advocate role here. Uh -huh. If you go through the rural water associations, that means you're no longer directly customer mm -hmm. facing. How do you still get that super valuable feedback, which made you what you are today? This is lessons learned from failed partnerships. But in the past, we still remain the face of that partnership. So it's more of a referral type partnership than it is what I would call like a resale partnership. And that's just based on experience. We've had some failed partnerships in the past where someone did take that front face view and that didn't work. But if we can remain kind of as a referral, there's a handoff, right? Someone raises their hand, they would like to work with 120. And then that's when we come in and directly serve them as a customer. You mentioned 85% are rural systems. I'm going to say something even stupider than me because again, I'm distant European, but if I'm right, it's also this 85% of the utilities which have three employees or mm -hmm. lesser. That means they are super busy running around, greasing the pumps, ensuring that everything just keeps afloat. Something I discussed with Josiah Cox from Central State Water Resources. How do they prioritize in their day this sometimes abstract topic of compliance and mm -hmm. of digitization, which is a big word? Well, that is why we will never, ever be a pure software company because this market needs and deserves strong managed services, right? And that's something that I think it's taken new investors in this market. It's a learning curve for them. I think that the level of managed services needed, but it's necessary. 
And it's either necessary because there aren't enough resources and many water systems need to augment that. And then it's also necessary because we're doing new things. And sometimes doing new things requires a train the trainer model for a certain period of time. So how we solve for it is we are very proud of the managed services that, that we provide. And that's you know, also we do that through partners as well. If we don't particularly do them, we will train our partners how to do it. You mentioned partners. You also said you're not only a software company, but you're partially a software company. And you have one of these very trendy buzzwords in your track record, which is machine learning. So mm. what's that stuff you're doing with Blue Conduit? Yes. So uh, Blue Conduit, is a, it's been a very good partnership for us. Uh, I, I have to laugh because for a while there, everyone thought we were super competitive. And, and then when we did an announcement, I think it kind of, people were like, oh my gosh, what's going on? But the reality is the partnership was so natural because we're each playing to our strengths, if that makes sense. We have a predictive intelligence machine learning model. They have one as well. But the reality is when we went to go focus on building out more software and more capabilities there, that's money that needed to be taken away from our machine learning practice. And so it just made natural sense to say, hey, Blue Conduit, you want to do this work. You can do this at scale better than we can. Can you be our primary provider of this? And let's formalize a partnership. And it's worked out very, very well. Again, we're able to bring their data into our system so that our mutual customers can act on that. And then we're able to give all of that predictive learning to them and they work their magic. So it's a win-win. So you mentioned everybody thought you were competitors and then you surprised everybody. So let me throw in another company with Simple Lab, where I was absolutely sure you would be competitors. And when I said that to Johnny Puyol, he said, no. We are at different levels of the value chain and we're customers one to another. So what would be your relationship with all that ecosystem? Yeah, I've actually referred people to, to Johnny. I, I, I think we certainly can be competitive if put in that situation. But the reality is our lab services ecosystem can connect. We're agnostic. We can connect into a Johnny API just like we could connect to a Pace Analytical or another type of laboratory. So the way we built our laboratory services model in our software is we can just plug and play. We can work with in-house labs, outhouse labs, or a company like Johnny's, and it's kind of all the same to us. So all those different bricks connect through APIs are complementary one to another. So at a certain point in time, there's going to be a consolidation and building a vertical. Will you be the one which eats all the other ones or are you a brick? In the world. I think we'll let Johnny continue to build out that vertical. How about that? Interesting. <laughs> no, I literally just talked to Johnny last week, so he's top of mind, and I just have to say that. It's so interesting because I think we are the front end. It's almost the relationship has to coexist between a 120 water and either a Johnny or a number of labs because what we're finding is that laboratory balancing and bringing sampling at scale, given what's happening in terms of the regulatory environment, is the only way these samples are going to get processed. Whether it's lead, PFOS, or the next thing, there has to be some conglomerate that is aggregating all of these samples on behalf of these programs that are being run because there's not enough physical infrastructure to get all the sampling done. You're offering a very smooth transition because like you're reading my mind, it's interesting. <laughs> there is this deadline by October 2024 for lead to be fully inventored. Now, and for some weeks now, as we record, there's a new deadline with 2027 by when you should be measuring your PFAS. And it's mm -hmm. not like the next thing, which will require every single little water system to do compliance work, to do some testing, to coordinate all of that. When I was discussing with Megan Plumley from Orange County, she was saying that was so much of a mess that they had to invest heavily in order to insource and have all of those capacity in-house. But that's Orange County. That's what you exactly. said about Everybody would like to be Denver Water, but not everybody's Denver Water. How can you, I mean, it's a different beast to do the same with PFAS, or is it like just another parameter? I don't want to oversimplify it because there are definitely some sampling needs that are unique to PFAS over any other parameter, but logistically it's the same. And again, that's why conversations with Johnny and other labs, we are in this unique position to be able to, it's called load balancing, right? To, to bring sampling to any crevice of the United States and territories. And that's a huge value, especially to these rural communities and even tribal communities where they don't know how they're going to get access to a PFAS sampling lab or 
if they do, the lab might charge them some astronomical price because it's so hard for them to get there and to return the samples. So it's an area that we are very capable and even have been experimenting with some partners at present to figure out how we solve that need. So if I was to sneak in your office and look at a roadmap, the next big topic is PFAS. That's one. What are the others? Yeah, that's one. You know, the others, I don't know if I can give all of this away, right? Um, but figuring out the sample management for PFOS is definitely a high priority for us. And we're already getting asked to do that. So making sure that we know how to do that and can deliver that on scale and make sure that we have the laboratory services network to back it up is, you're right, is definitely priority between now and the end of the year. Let's talk money, if you will. What is your business model today? Are you selling software licenses? Are you also still offering this tech-enabled services, which you mentioned in the beginning? Where do you get the money from? We basically three categories of revenue. We license our software applications, and those have different license levels depending on the the functionality that the customer is purchasing. We have our services, both professional services as well as managed service packages. And again, those are built for those systems that want more recurring monthly services from our team. And then we have products. So all of our water testing kits and sampling SKUs, letters, we do the majority of our mailings on behalf of our customers, and that's automated through our SIF platform, and then all remediation. So that's the pitcher filter remediation kits. We're growing in all three of those areas, and, and we don't have any plans to, to discontinue one over the other, and we'll just kind of grow as, as demand in the market grows. And consumes those different lines. There's this elephant in the room, which I haven't addressed yet, but as we talk money, that's the place I have to. You've made a spectacular capital raise in early 2024 with a $43 million raise from Edison Partners. What does that enable you to do? And what's the story of that one? Yes, that is the, the 43 million elephant in the room. It's been a passion and a vision of mine to just continue to expand the platform, but not at the expense of our core customers, right? And that's really our utility customers and particularly the lead programs that we are just so great at executing right our customers through the 120 platforms we wanted to keep the core business intact and profitable while exploring adjacencies in water whether that means adjacencies in the utility space or potentially in other segments of the market edison partners we had known them for i think all in we knew them for about 36 months before we actually did the deal they would come back really annoying just are you ready yet are you ready and we knew we needed to get the business to a certain place, particularly from a cash flow perspective, because we didn't want to be reliant on having to raise a single dime on that core business. We wanted all of the investment that we raised primarily to go through growth and uh, growth in other areas. Long story short, the timing kind of finally aligned when Edison came back about a year ago and said, we're still interested. And I said, okay, I think, I think we've gotten the economics of, of 120 about there. We have an installed customer race where we projected and really wanted to be. And they believed, most importantly, in the vision of 120 and, and how can we really invest both in inorganic and organic growth of 120 Water to really build a platform with a capital P. Let's make a picture of what 120 Water was the minute before Edison invested. So you mentioned you secured your three pillars. That means mm -hmm. core of 120 Water is growing with its natural pace, turning with its annual recurring revenue and profitable. Then you say you want to explore adjacencies. What are those adjacencies? Lead is just one parameter across hundreds of water quality parameters that our customers are managing on a daily basis. There's a lot more opportunity that we could be doing in the water quality space. When you go into the asset and infrastructure space, we now have the largest lead service line database in the United States with our millions of lines under management. So we have one toe already in asset management and, and visibility into that. So there's you know infrastructure and asset management areas to go into. And then there are just other compliance events that our customers have to do that maybe aren't water quality related or asset management related, but because we house a lot of that data already, it might make sense for us to build out additional capabilities and functionality. So again, lead is just one of many things our customers are doing on a daily basis, and, and we'd like to be doing more for them. And so the third part in what you said was that there would be organic and inorganic growth. What's your idea of inorganic growth? I'm a 
big fan of deciding build, buy, and partner. Not everything should be built in-house if there's a potential value to partner or buy an, a, a solution, right? I think combining forces can sometimes be a one plus one equals three equations for the customer. And so, you know, we've only been invested, what, three and a half, four months. So it's not like we have this strategy baked out, but there are certainly areas and companies where we think it it probably makes a stronger case to either partner in a more embedded way or even potentially buy. So you have good and strong ideas, but you can't share yet. Can't share yet. But if anyone is interested, you know where to find me. How about that? Yeah, that's a good one. You said several times, particularly in the US. So when I hear particularly in the US, I also hear, but also potentially somewhere else. To which on lead itself, I know that in Paris, lead has been installed up to 1992. So it's not that old that we stop installing lead. And as we're replacing about 0.2 to 0.5% of networks every year, good chances that it's still in the network for a while. The problem though, is that when you're into compliance and regulations and stuff like that, it's very, very different from one country to another. So is that hurdle too high and you will never go anywhere else than let's say North America, or you have in a portion of your mind that, yeah, what Orina Brechger is doing with building AquaCycle in Europe is something mm -hmm. Water could do as well in the beautiful church in, in, in I think, Belgium, where they, they install their European headquarters or yeah. some different place. I'm never going to say never. I think sequencing and timing matters, right? From a technology standpoint, again, we've always built with international thought. So we're not preventing, technically speaking, but practically, I, I think the, the question is at what point in time it, would it make sense? And is that more of a strategic partnership that brings us in to another international market or is that something we do internally? So I would say it's not on the near term roadmap, but it's certainly not off the long term. Map. How about that? I can't remember the name of the, the German brothers, which were building ripoffs of US companies. Oh, Samler. Oh, Samler yes. Brothers, which were building Zalando. And then, I mean, every single US company had a European ripoff so that at some point the US company had to acquire the European ripoff because that was the way to go to market. So that means if I build, let's say, 12 water or 121 water in Europe, and yep. at some point that might be a way to, to jump across and to say, okay, that's the way. Listen, I'd welcome that. You get the infrastructure figured out and that's a lot easier. That's a lot more tangible for me to bite off. So There was one thing in the announcement of your money raise, which is not conventional, Mm -hmm. which mentioned that you also took the opportunity to restructure a bit the company. To which mm -hmm. you're thinking, as you said today as well, you're in that for 10 years and it can be harsh to be a war entrepreneur and it's mm -hmm. not easy days most of the times. In the beginning, you don't pay yourself and so far and so on. Is that the kind of place where you're thinking, okay, I might also cash out a bit or for your early employees as well, mm -hmm. or is restructuring purely an investor story? We're almost... 10 years in and for a lot of our early investors, that's kind of exceeded a fund cycle, you know? And so we needed to kind of give those early investors something back. And I'm proud to say everyone stayed in and even some really tried to double that. So no one wanted to get out, but I think just the nature of funds and the life cycle of those funds, it was necessary for some early investors to get some out, but only because of fund cycle and needs within their portfolio, not necessarily the excitement about the continued forward on 120. So we're, you know, employees and management myself, we're all doubling down. So it's the pure mechanical stuff linked to the funds. Yeah. And Edison wanted to own a particular share as well. So when you're dealing with a, a pie and that pie has a finite amount of slices, you just kind of, you figure it out. Before we record it, so People are not supposed to know, but I'm cracking the secret because I'm this kind of untrustworthy person. You said new bosses, but you're still boss, right? Right. Oh, but you're sneaky. I see what you did there. What's the size of 120 water from a human perspective nowadays? How many people are working? Are you all sitting in the same office? Are you a remote company? What is it like to work at 120 water today? Because I think that might be interesting for people listening to that because you might want to hire more. Always. Yes. Talent is everything. Our people are everything. And so, yes, we're always hiring across the organization. So we are a little over 90 folks strong. We are a distributed workforce and became a lot more distributed because of COVID. We've never come back into what I would call one central headquarters. 
although we are starting to do more recurring in person, you know, trying to figure out how we structure the space to bring local folks back in a more recurring way, and then also budget for all company gatherings uh, a few times a year, because those are so important as we build on our workforce. So we are distributed. Some roles are more distributed than others, especially like in sales and customer service and account management. But yeah, that's that's kind of the nature of our work and, and how we work. Which gets me to what are you building in the long run? I mean, we spoke four years ago, so let's say four years again in the future. What's 120 water by then? I mean, you drop one other word and we are 120 or... We're just water. Water co. <laughs> it's a good one. I don't know if anyone ever tried that. We want to be a great company, right? Just bringing continuous value to our customers, healthy economics. And at the end of the day, I think hopefully four years now, we are a household name. You ever hear that saying, no one got fired for buying IBM? Or I don't know what the equivalent in this century would be, but I really hope that at some point, 120 can be an operating system that is relied upon in every utility and every state agency to do better work, whether that's through compliance, other program management that they're doing or in the field or in the lab. The underlying question, which I already kind of addressed in our conversation today is that when I was speaking with your colleague in the Elemental Accelerator matter, you could see that on the long run, having a filter which eliminates microplastics, that might be something which will be snapped by a major company building washing machines. When I'm discussing with Craig Beckman from Aqua Membranes, he has this vision of a specialized subset of membrane companies which would be coming together. But he also agrees that the most probable path is that one major me membrane company is going to snap them and so far and so on. That sounds like the reasonable and you don't have to be reasonable to be a water entrepreneur, so it doesn't have to be that. But it's the right. real outcome in many of the cases. Now, it might be the limits of my imagination, but when I'm talking to you, when I'm talking to, to, to Johnny, when I'm talking to that kind of super cool kids, but also weird space within the water because mm -hmm. I don't see the giant which would be able to snap you, which means mm -hmm. whether you are building the giant or there is a giant outside of the water sector who thinks, oh, a water OS, super cool. What is the most probable outcome out of those two? Let me get out my crystal ball. I think where we, and I, I, mean, I don't mean to dismiss the question, but I think you know we are focused on building a great businesses and great businesses have great outcomes. I think we don't have unicorn expectations because unicorns don't exist in water. And if you think they do, then you probably should invest in water. So I think if we continue to do what we say we're going to do and build a great business, I think the outcome will present itself. And I do think that there's optionality on that. And I do think some of the decisions that we make over the next couple of years might help decide that outcome or those two paths more firmly. But yeah, it's hard to say right now. And, and I think it's just, we're, we're just trying to get the business, you know, focus on building a great business. And then we do believe that, that good outcomes will come. And what's the impact you'll have? Exactly. We measure, you know, we measure the lives impacted, right? For every tap that we test or lead service line that we ID, you know, we know that we're helping identify a public health issue, right? So Megan, we're speaking every time you make a major fundraising. So do you have one more planned or do we need to pick another milestone for the sequel? Oh, I think we might have another milestone in a few years. We'll see. Okay. I promise you this time I don't miss any. I really want to have you on the next big milestone. Thanks a lot for the openness in the sharing of your path, which honestly was amazing the first time we spoke is amazing on steroids nowadays. So thanks a lot for that sharing. I think it's inspirational for people who want to go into that space. If that's fine with you, I propose to switch to the rapid fire questions. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is the toughest challenge in your opinion for a water tech startup? Achieving traction. What would be your best single piece of advice for the founders and managers of the about 1,000 early stage water startups? Take your plan and multiply the timeline by three at least and your cash by three at least. Segway, is it what happened to you? Oh, absolutely. Well, but, you know, then peppered in with a COVID. I mean, no one had that on the business plans. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The video game becomes more difficult. What's the drop of knowledge you wish more investors knew about the water sector? I do wish that some investors understood that there, there are no unicorns in water. Well, technically, there's one. Technically, there's one. And one in every bunch, I guess. Huh? What was your most unexpected partnership and what did it bring you? Unexpected. 
the failed ones brought us a lot of wasted money, but I will tell you, it, it, it has to be our national world water. It brought us access to communities that we would not have otherwise been able to tap into directly. Any failed one which you can share? I don't think I can name them on record. I think I, I might have a confidential clause, but be careful about those corporates. They will take, take, take and suck you and, um, and not much to show for it. Super short, profitability or growth? Right now, profitability. Yeah. Yeah. Growth always. What's the next profile you'll hire? Chief product officer. Interesting. And when you hire that chief product officer, what's the most important for you, sector experience or startup experience? For this one, it's going to be sector. So a water person, which is a chief product officer for a digital product. And you say unicorns don't, don't exist, but you're looking for one, right? We're looking for one. We may, we may or may not have found one. So announcement coming soon. <laughs> Would you be opening new markets or doubling down on the current ones? Doubling down. What's that tool nobody speaks about, but you couldn't live without? My pencil. That's a first. And yep. what's the single piece of insight your ideal customer needs to hear right now? That it's going to be okay. Because it's a big... Yeah, our, our customers are in a pressure cooker. What I like to say is we are 50% problem solvers and executors and sometimes 50% therapists just because our customers have so much on their plates. It's going to be okay, but sometimes in the moment it doesn't feel like it, right? What are you desperately needing and want to raise an open call for right now? So yes, we are hiring and would love to hear from anybody who would like to join the fastest growing water technology company. Do you have like a formal number of positions open or is it like whoever wants to send in their resume? I mean, we're always hiring customer success managers. We're always hiring sales folks, both at all experience levels and then engineers, so software engineers. But honestly, we just, we will take any resume and follow up with talented folks when we get them. What can and should I do for you? Keep doing what you're doing. I shared with you off the record that I love that the content that you are producing and the conversations are just incredible. So thank you for spreading the word and having us all share our stories and just keep doing what you're doing. Well, that's something I can do. That's cool. Excellent. <laughs> that's the place for me to do that, that plug, which is you mentioned very clearly the type of profile you'll be looking into. So if you are one of those profiles, well, I think if you haven't got yet the message that Megan is super cool, I just will state it again. Megan is super cool. Reach out. <laughs> so where should they reach out? What's the best place to follow up with you? Oh, my directly. My email is Megan, M-E-G-A-N at 120water.com. So definitely reach out directly. And yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're going to be looking for roles and leadership and all sorts of things. So whether it's partnerships or talent or whatnot, I would love to hear from you. As always, the links are in the description. So if you're watching, listening to that, go check it out. Megan, it's been a renewed pleasure to have you on that microphone. Thanks a lot. And I really think we should not wait four more years to have a sequel of the sequel. So whenever you have the next big milestone, make sure to come on the microphone before I even dare to ask you. It's my pleasure. It's always so fun to be with you. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. you. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.